Oh yes, it's been such a great day. Things have been so busy. Oh my, I gotta go. It's my new reading adventure time. Yes, I have such a new book surprise from the library and I'm so excited, but I gotta go. I gotta get the kids all cozy in their little nooky rooms and just have a fun adventure. So I'll call you back later, okay? And I'll let you know about the book we read. Or you can go on for Reading for Purpose and follow us along. It would be great to have you following us along. Hey, and don't forget, Click down below, subscribe, and leave us a comment and let the kids know of some other cool reading books that they can check out at the library. Okay, gotta go. Bye. Oh my goodness, guys. I am so excited. I'm so sorry you caught me on a call. I couldn't wait to meet up with you guys. But here we are on our personal what? reading adventure so thank you for stopping by for reading for purpose as you see the the settings a little different i'm in a little nooky corner got a little com two little comfy pillows right here and above all i got a new reading book so sit down or lay down wherever you want to do just get nice and cozy so we can enjoy this book together and remember listen for the lesson that you can learn so you can be everything that the lord jesus created you to be remember today's a beautiful and blessed day and i'm so happy we're sharing this time together so let's get started so the title of today's book is the only woman in the photo francis perkins and her new deal for america it's written by Kathleen Cruel and illustrated by Alexandra Bai. If I didn't say the author or the illustrator's name right, I apologize. This looks so interesting. I can't wait. Okay, I like to read to you guys the review, or I should say the brief summary of the story, not a review, a summary of the story. And this here, sometimes it can be found in the front of the book, or sometimes it can be found in the back, or sometimes it can be found in both. But this little summary will basically tell you about the book that we are reading. And if you're home alone and you're reading this book or any other book, it'll tell you the book you're reading. So let's find out what's this about. Most people know about President FDR, but do you know about the incredible woman behind his groundbreaking New Deal? As a young girl, Frances Perkins was very shy and quiet, but her grandmother encouraged Frances to always challenge herself. When somebody opens a door to you, go forward. And so she did. Frances realized she had to make her voice heard even when speaking made her uncomfortable and use it to fight injustice and build programs to protect people across the nation. So when newly elected President Franklin Delano Roosevelt asked Frances to be the first female secretary of labor, wow, and help pull the nation out of the Great Depression, she knew she had to walk through that open door and forward into history. In this empowering, inspirational biography, discover how the first woman to serve in a presidential cabinet led the charge to create the safety net that protects American workers and their families to this day. Wow, she made such an impact that we are living the movement that she made then. We're living it now. So you see how somebody can do... Um, can take apart uh, or do something and impact history so much that the future generations get to live it. And we have to take advantage of those privileges and those freedoms that the people before us fought or strove in some way to give us. We have to embrace it, respect it, and make way for the future generations to walk in the liberties, the justice, the freedoms that we ourselves got to embrace. So beautiful picture. Can you find Miss Frances? I can, there she is. the only woman in the photo so who are we talking about francis perkins Ooh, look another photo i'm moving up closer so you can see there it is little francis perkins was shy she couldn't speak up even when asking for a book at the library or a spool of thread at the store in her cozy new england town she was most comfortable around her grandmother, who encouraged her always to keep trying. She would say, 
Take the high ground. If someone insults you and when someone opens a door to you, go forward. So Shy Francis tried her hardest in everything she did. That's an important lesson for us to always learn, to give our best in everything that we do. Remember, we have a, 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 an opportunity to make a difference. And above all, we should live every moment of our lives. What? Honoring the Lord Jesus and impacting the lives of others for his glory. Frances was quiet, but she was a watcher and a listener. She was sad to see young Irish immigrants being screamed at and chased by those who hated newcomers. She felt sorry that her best friend's family was not as well off as her, hers. Her parents said that if you were poor, it was your own fault. But Frances wondered. She couldn't stand the thought of children going hungry or being in pain, and she couldn't see how it was their fault. She knew first aid and other kids turned to her when they were hurt. She followed her grandmother's advice and always tried to help. That's another good lesson. We should always seek opportunity to help others. Remember, you don't have to do something big to make a difference. Even the little things count. Frances was a thinker at a time when high education for women was new. People feared that women's delicate bodies would suffer if their brains got too big. Did they say their brains got too big? Oh my. But her father saw how smart Frances was. He taught her to read at an early age and encouraged her to go on learning. In high school, she mastered tough classes, including Latin and Greek. She blossomed from a whisperer to a star debater. The point was always to challenge herself. Going to college meant the world to Francis, and a history course there shaped her future. The professor required students to observe the depressing conditions in the nearby paper and textile mills. Francis was horrified, especially at the small children toiling alongside adults. The experience opened her eyes to other injustice in America, like those she glimpsed as a child. But these were the days when nobody expected the government to do anything, she said. Frances ached to help. To do that, she realized she had to make her voice heard, even when speaking made her uncomfortable. In speaking up, Frances was learning to lead. Wow, so we see here two lessons, actually. We see here that it's very important to be passionate about learning. And we also see here that you don't hesitate to speak up for what's right. Remember, in the small or in the big, you are able to make a difference as long as you stand for truth. Move this paint is sticky. Okay. Against her parents' wishes, they preferred she start husband hunting. She moved to New York City and began working. A new way to help fight injustice called social work was flourishing there. The more she saw, the more she wanted to help. I had to do something about the unnecessary hazards to life, unnecessary poverty. It was sort of up to me. She started off delivering milk and food to starving children, getting landlords to give a break to those unable to pay their rent, and asking for donations. In, in dangerous neighborhoods, she defended herself with the tip of her umbrella. Ooh. Wow. So these were the ways that she was helping to bring change in the community. For these social justice issues to get proper attention, Frances believed women had to get more power. So, I'm sorry, so she went even further. She was fierce fighter for women's rights to vote. She spoke out about suffrage on the street corners, bringing her own grocery crate to stand on. She honed her speaking skills, projected her voice, and used humor to deflect hecklers. And here on the bed, as I show you the picture, it says votes for women. So she was prepping herself to be able to speak out and speak up. Why? So she can help in making a difference. 
after getting more education in social work and publishing her own articles on the subject, Frances kept working to protect others by taking a job gathering information of unsafe workplaces. She visited more than 100 bakeries taking notes. Bread, donuts, and pies were baked in airless rooms with dirt floors. Oh, wow. Rats nibbled on bags of flour and cats had kittens on the counters. Dirty water instead of chocolate dripped into pastries. Francis saw sick workers bending over the dough and coughing. Children huddled there with their parents because they had nowhere else to go. She wrote it all down in her report. When she presented it to New York's Board of Health, bakeries were forced to improve conditions. Wow. So she got to see here that people were working in hazardous conditions and not only adults, but children were in these workplaces. So not only were they getting sick, but Customers could have been getting sick as well. But when Frances spoke up and spoke out, she helped bring change. Oh, I'm so sorry. But Frances didn't stop there. Next on her list was fire safety. She inspected 26 laundries, finding danger everywhere. This problem was urgent. It became even more urgent after one horrible day in 1911. 30-year-old Frances was having tea with friends when the group heard the clanging of fire truck bells and an unearthly shrieking. She lifted up her long skirt and ran toward the scene of a fire. The Triangle Shirtwaist factory was burning and the management worried about theft had locked all the doors. Did they lock the doors? Did that mean the workers were locked in the building while it was on fire? Oh my. The factory employed Italian and Jewish immigrants, mostly women and girls in their teens and early 20s, and they were all trapped. The fire claimed a total of 146 victims. The youngest were only 14 years old. Oh my God, so that means those people were locked in a burning building and 146 of them died. Wow. Frances was sick to her stomach and then outraged. To her, this was murder, a tragedy that could have been prevented. If no one else would become the voice for these women, Frances would try. So again, we see here that Frances saw where there was change needed and she was willing and ready to speak up and speak out. Witnessing the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire turned Frances Perkins into an activist. So intent on helping others that she was ready to enter the all-male world of politics. Former President Theodore Roosevelt was heading up a committee on New York City workplace safety. He heard good things about Frances as an expert investigator, so he recommended her to run the committee. She began taking the others on tours of work sites to view firsthand the dangers of greedy managers not protecting their workers. She studied the men she worked with, looking for ways to overcome prejudice. Some men would never treat her as an equal, but if she reminded them of their mothers in her staid three-cornered hat, she seemed to have more success. Her intense study of how men acted was worth it. The committee agreed with her, and the modern fire precautions we have today, glass cases with fire extinguishers, fire exit, fire drills, and water sprinklers began to be required. Wow. The city passed the most comprehensive workplace safety laws in the nation. Wow. So we see with Francis speaking up and speaking out on the dangers of all the different workplaces that she would go and visit and talk about and report about that she was able today when you go to stores or when you're in buildings and you see fire extinguishers fire hoses that's because she spoke up spoke out and she brought positive change that's amazing It wasn't long after Al Smith, the governor of New York State, rewarded Frances' hard work with her first big break in government. He appointed her to the commission that regulated workplaces across the whole state. She was tongue-tied for a moment, but she decided to accept. 
The job was not just a grand opportunity to make her voice heard on the issues that mattered to her, but it was so significant that it made her the highest paid woman to hold public office in the United States at the time. Wow. In her new role, Frances kept arguing for change, helping to pass dozens of laws that made New York safer for workers in copper mines, construction sites, and factories all across the state. Wow. So we see here that speaking up and speaking out brought a lot of change. And on top of that, it brought a lot of awareness. When people are aware of issues and are made known of things that are wrong, that need to be made right, it allows movement to occur. It allows people to think and act in a way that brings change. In 1929, New York's, I'm sorry, New York new governor Franklin D. Roosevelt appointed Francis the state industrial commissioner, overseeing more than 1,700 employees in seven cities. As soon, and soon it turned out FDR would need Francis more than ever. When the stock market crashed on Black Tuesday, October 29th, 1929, it propelled the nation into the Great Depression. The country suffered as they had before. About a third of working Americans lost their jobs. Then many lost their homes. Francis visited encampments of miserable families living in cardboard boxes and tents. President Herbert Hoover kept making reassuring statements predicting that recovery was around the corner. Francis was furious. She knew it was not and she had to speak up or else people would start blaming themselves for being out of work. In 1930, she called a press conference to announce that Hoover was wrong and that she had the facts and the numbers to prove it. Yes, Francis Perkins had just challenged the president. Telegrams and phone calls poured in to criticize her. But she said, I felt the satisfaction of someone who told the truth. Wow. So we see here that Francis knew the truth. So where somebody high of an official, a president, as we read in the story, um, he was saying something that was making the people believe a lie. But Francis wouldn't have it. She wanted to stand for the truth at all costs, even if people didn't like her, even if people didn't want to hear her, and even if people didn't want to agree with her. She was willing to stand for the truth to make sure that she would bring the right change that was needed. So she spoke up and spoke out. I hope you're liking this story because I am. Let me make sure I'm so sorry. I want to make sure I didn't skip a page. Yes. In the 1932 election, Hoover was defeated in a landslide by none other than Francis Boss, FDR. And he wanted Francis as the Secretary of Labor in his cabinet of advisors. Whoa. He was proposing a new deal, a fresh start for Americans in need. And she was a crucial part of the plan. At 52 years old, Frances hesitated. The challenge seemed extreme. And as the first woman to ever join a presidential cabinet, she would face a storm of criticism. Criticism. But her grandmother's advice sailed in her mind and she knew what she had to do. The door might not be open to a woman again for a long, long time. And I had a kind of duty to walk in and sit down in the chair that was offered. Challenging herself and using her voice, she realized would allow her to protect people across the nation and inspire women at the same time. Wow. So we see here that every time Frances was bold to speak up and speak out and strive to obtain the change that was so needed for people, for communities, for the nation as a whole, it finally paid off. It's amazing. So Frances decided she'd accept the job if FDR allowed her to do it her way. She had been thinking of ideas for years. Now she wrote all her requests on slips of paper, a to-do list for helping the most vulnerable. At their meeting, she held them up and she watched the president's eyes to make sure he understood what she was planning. The scope of her list was, of her list was breathtaking. 
It was nothing less than a restructing of American society. Their talk lasted one hour until he finally said, I'll back you. Wow. So you see here, Frances was making up a list all along, all throughout the years of the change that she felt was so needed within our nation. And this time she went to the president and he was willing to back her up. So you see, don't worry about if people support you or not. God will send those that he know will help you to do that that you need to do. So always stand for the truth, speak up, speak out, and be bold. Newspapers had headlines like Boston Girl, First Woman Cabinet Member, Frances Perkins, Hardworking. Sure enough, Frances was now one of the 10 most powerful people in government in the whole country. Her Department of Labor was in charge of all matters concerning American workers. On her first day on the job, she took control of her desk only to find the drawers crawling with the largest cockroaches she had ever seen. It seemed a sign of how corrupt and inefficient the department had been. She rolled up her sleeves, scrubbed out her desk, and plunged into working, basically around the clock. So Frances was ready to make some more change. At her first cabinet meeting, nervous about how best to make herself heard, Frances decided on a quiet approach. I wanted to give the impression of being a quiet, orderly woman who didn't buzz buzz all the time. As she had on her very first committee, she knew she would have to make the other men take her seriously. Finally, FDR turned to her with a smile. Well, Miss Perkins, have you anything to say? Anything to contribute? She spoke briefly about her recommendations for reducing unemployment. And after that, the men treated her as an equal. Sort of. Some men in her department did threaten to resign rather than report to a woman. Others acted like schoolboys and passed silly notes about her during meetings. One day she testified before Congress and a congressman remarked, she's an awful smart woman, but I'd hate to be married to her. When Frances heard about the insult, she laughed it off, retorting that I hadn't asked him. She had a job to do. See? So remember... When you stand up, right, and you speak up and you speak out and you're bold to make change, positive change, not only for your life, but the lives of others, you might not always be embraced by people. Matter of fact, you might go through persecution. What does that mean? That means people might make fun of you. It means people might not want to spend time with you. But at the end of the day, that doesn't matter. What matters is bringing true change, change that will not only help you, but the lives of others. And above all, it honors the Lord Jesus because he says, stand for truth, stand for the weak, the helpless, those that can't help themselves. The first hundred days were critical. Frances had two phones on her desk and would sometimes answer both at the same time. Mostly though, she was out of her office initiating a blizzard of big moves and an alphabet soup of agencies. The Civilian Conservation Corps, for example, put more than two million young people to work, taking care of national resources, stocking rivers with fish, planting trees and digging canals for, for flood control. With this and her many other undertakings, it was thrilling for her to see how directly she was helping the people. Wherever she was, at steel factories, on the docks, with shipyard workers in California testifying before Congress, she was a voice for calm. Her goal was to establish a sense of security during a nerve-wracking crisis. She accepted every invitation to speak, feeling responsible for explaining the New Deal to the public. She met with FDR every 10 days or so, and he liked to hear her advice in the form of a story. Who specifically was going to be helped? What exactly would be the result of the action she re recommended? With a story, he could then relate to others. He would always support her latest idea. Change was really happening. See, no matter how hard your work is, don't give up. Push forward. Speak up. Speak out and see the change occur. 
Magazine headlines hailed Francis, Francis. One called her the woman nobody knows, giving her full credit for the New Deal. In official pictures, she was usually the only woman in the photo. And as I show you the pictures, there's going to be one that says Sunday Lita, who is Francis Perkins. The other one says Times $1, the month of November, Fearless Francis. Then another one says, Work Hard, Fearless Francis, fe Female in the Cabinet. Then the other one says, Post, The Woman Nobody Knows, Francis Perkins, The Woman Behind the New Deal. Then another one says, The Enquirer. And then it says, hard working Francis Perkins. And lastly, it says, thanks, Francis. See if you can spot her in the pictures. Can you spot her? I'm sorry. Honey. I can spot her in a couple pictures. Like, there she is. There she is. Can we see her? Yep. There she is. 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 And if I'm right, this is her right there. But let me check. Yep, there she is. So she was the only woman surrounded by men. And she was making big change. Her most far-reaching dream became a reality in 1935 when FDR signed the Life-Changing Social Security Act into law. It established insurance for old age and for people who lost their jobs. It ensured compensation for those injured on the job. It guaranteed aid to the needy and disabled and even children under 18 in single parent families. It was, she said, a security structure which aims to protect our people against the major hazards of life. It was basically her entire to-do list. She saw it as a turning point in our national life, a turn from careless neglect of human values toward people working together for a common good. Hurdling one obstacle after another, boldly speaking up, she transformed the government into a force that helped protect people. On a gigantic scale, she had reached her childhood goal of helping others. Wow, so Francis did it. She spoke up, she spoke out, and she saw change occur. Amazing. I had accomplished what I had come to do. She declared hoping to return to a quieter life, but FDR valued her too much to accept her resignation. So res resignation means she was going to quit. She was at his side from his first day as president to his last day in 1945. In one of their final meetings, she was crying as he grasped her hand. Francis, you have done awfully well. I know what you have been through. I know what you have accomplished. Thank you. After his death, she was finally allowed to resign. She kept working for her causes and lecturing at universities, universities, but out of the public eye. I haven't a flair for publicity, Frances said. She absolutely refused to write a book about herself. Once she said that seeing her picture in the newspaper nearly kills me. She actually stomped on the camera of one photographer who took her picture despite her pleas not to. So you see, Frances never stopped speaking up nor speaking out. So when Frances died after suffering a stroke in 1965 at age 85, not many people remembered who she was and what she had accomplished. Social security, fire safety, workplaces, regulations, and many of the other laws that keep us safe are things we take for granted. But we should never forget the person who made them happen. A shy little girl who cared about others and grew up to protect them. Wow. Amazing. So we see here that Frances Perkins lived speaking up, speaking out, and bringing change. That we today, our generation today, and future generations get to enjoy, get to experience. Wow. Okay, so real quick, I'm going to read, um, it says, 
The Power of Frances Perkins. So we're gonna read what they write about her real quick. So let me just sit back and snuggle up again. And it says here, this page is a little long, so don't mind. It says, Strand by Strand, Frances Perkins lived from 1880 to 1965, helped weave a safety net that protects all Americans to this day. The odds against accomplishing what she did during her era are so high that we have to ask, how in the world did she do it? How did she come to be the only woman in the photo? One factor that helped was a certain amount of luck. Being in the right place at the right time, she was able to develop leadership skills at, at an all-woman college at a time when barriers to higher education for women were just starting to be dropped. The field of social work, a practical way of helping others and fighting for social justice was also brand new, fostered by women and an ideal direction for her goals. Perkins always insisted that she was a product of women who had influenced her, starting with her beloved grandmother, Mary Leon, who lived from 1797 to 1849. The founder of her college, Mount Holyoke, had as her motto, go forward, attempt great things, accomplish great things. Perkins drew inspiration from other women who came before her, such as Eda Tarbell, who lived from 1857 to 1944, a pioneer of investigative journalism, and Jane Addams, who lived from 1816 to 1935, founder of the American profession of social work. But her biggest mentor and cheerleader by far was Florence Kelly, who lived from 1859, 1859 to 1932, a pioneer of social and political reform. One of Kelly's speeches said Perkins first opened my mind to the necessity for and the possibility of the work which became my vocation. Perkins was also aided by the fact that thanks to her hard work and glowing reputation, she had earned the support of powerful man, a president so popular he was elected to four terms in office. For a man of his day, FDR was unusually open-minded toward woman, perhaps due to being the son of a strong woman and husband to one of the most revered women in American history, Eleanor Roosevelt. Additionally, she was working toward her goal during a time of severe crisis. The depression made so many people so desperately poor that it affected a change in the country's idea about being poor. Poverty wasn't a character flaw at all. For the first time, many in government saw the need to help. The time was right, but knowing the odds were against her as a woman, Frances also had to cultivate a certain amount of denial about it. Being a woman had only bothered me in climbing trees. As much as possible, she tried to ignore her gender and focus on her work. She found it helpful to fill a red envelope she called the male mind with notes about how men thought and how she could best make them listen. Her work ethic was amazing, as was her lack of fear. You, can't, you just can't be afraid if you're going to accomplish anything. Perkins also had the motivation of being the sole support of her husband and her daughters, both of whom had significant health problems. Perhaps above all, it was her voice and striking way she was able to use it that led her to success. Speaking was her superpower speaking up for herself and then for others. Frances was, was a powerful woman, so ahead of her time that many didn't know what to make of her. Combine these elements helped her reach the goals she had been working for her whole life. It would be another 20 years before another woman joined the president's cabinet. Today, the Department of Labor is housed in a building named for her, where a plaque reads, this building is dedicated to the memory of Frances Perkins. Secretary of Labor from 1933 to 1945, whose legacy of social action enhances the lives of all American workers. In wartime and peace and depression and recovery, she articulated the hopes and dreams of working people and worked untiringly to make those hopes and dreams a reality through the force of her moral courage, intellect, and will. She brought sweeping changes to our nation's laws and practices and forever improved our society. And then at the end of this biography book, they list sources. So sources is where they got the information. Pretty cool. And then the last page. And you see, oh wow, it shows, I guess, all the different women. And then you get to find Frances Perkins. Beautiful. So these could be the women that inspired her. 
Or these could also be the women that are throughout history that have brought change to our nation. So that's pretty interesting. So we see here that the lesson throughout the whole story is speak up, speak out, and bring positive change. At the last part of the book, the book spoke about Frances having superpower and about um, her being able to achieve as much as she did because of luck. But as children of the Most High God, I just want to remind you, we don't believe in luck. We know that Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of all, has created us with what? The divine destiny, divine purpose. And we know that the Lord uses us to be vessels of what? Hope, change, light, love. He ordains our life. It's not luck that ordains our life. We're created with purpose. And through Christ Jesus, we can be everything he's called us to be. And we can do everything he's ordered us to do in life for his glory. And before we end today's reading adventure, I just want to give you the Bible verse you can think on. It's 1 Corinthians 10, 31. And it is written, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So remember, in everything we do, it's for God's glory. So be bold and stand out. Don't be scared. Don't let fear limit you. Don't let fear quiet you. But know who you are in Christ Jesus. Speak up, speak out, and be the change that Jesus created you to be. So again, my little readers, I thank you for stopping by. Thank you for sharing your wonderful time with me on our new reading adventure. And I can't wait to meet back up with you again. Bye. <laughs>